broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Roberta Maselli, and I am the senior, a senior director of language and education at the Center for Applied Linguistics. And I'm so pleased to bring you the fourth in a series of Cal Policy One Takes. This is our fourth and final update that we're planning to provide for you during this um, COVID-19 pandemic. For those of you that have been along for the ride, you'll, know, you'll remember that the first policy one take was on the topic of the assessment and accountability waivers that the United States Department of Education was granting and all of the states, Puerto Rico and DC, have taken advantage of. You'll know that our second one take was on the topic of adult education. Our third one take just last week was on the one of the new funding streams, the ESSERS funding stream that is available for states and states will be distributing to districts through, from the United States Department of Education. And today's policy one take is about um, policy support for distance learning. So before we get into the content, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Chelsea, who's going to tell you some of the logistics related to today's webinar. Chelsea? Thank you, Roberta. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so that y'all are aware, I will be monitoring the question and chat box. If you want to share some thoughts or ask a question during the presentation, feel free to down um, in the questions box and you'll just uh, apply. And if it's something that we can share, um, that's a really great resource. We'll make sure to apply uh, all so that everyone on the webinar will be able to see um, that really wonderful resource. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we will post it on our YouTube channel and it will be linked on our free resource page on the Center for Applied Linguistics website. And I'm about to uh, share those two websites with you right now. Um, but before we get started, I just wanna say thank you all for being with us. Thank you to our essential workers, for our teachers, our parents, um, for all of those out there doing the hard work that ne needs to be done right now. Thank you so much to our medical professionals. So Roberta, at that, I will send it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, so just briefly for everyone, um, I wanna call your attention to the miss mission of the Center for Applied Linguistics, which is to promote language learning and cultural understanding by serving as a trusted source for research resources and policy analysis. And as you are very well aware, this series of the Cal Policy One Take webinars has focused on that part of Cal's mission that is related to policy analysis. So for those of you that were with us last week when we were talking about the one of the funding streams that is available to states now, this slide will look familiar to you. Just a little bit of grounding for today's webinar. Um, on March 27th, President Trump signed uh, the CARES Act, which provided a very large amount of money for use related directly to the COVID-19 pandemic. And within that large package of funds, there were um, 30.75 billion was set aside for education. And within that large amount that was set aside for education, a portion of that amount what has been um, made available by the United States um, Department of Education, and it is called the ESSER Fund. It is a one of the four funding streams that have been made available through the CARES Act for states, that this one in particular, for states, for the very specified and flexible purpose of supporting continued learning for K-12 students whose education has been disrupted by the coronavirus. I've highlighted um, and underlined that last phrase because that phrase is going to be important as we continue through this webinar because of the fact that 
the funding is purposefully extremely flexible for states, for local school divisions, and for schools, the only requirement is that they have to do, they have to be able to um, specify how the funds are being directly related to any type of disruption related to the coronavirus. A little more specifically, and what we're going to focus on today are the, are the two um, pieces that I've underlined and bolded, and that is for these ESSER funds, which have been distributed to states using the 2019 Title I funding formula, and then states are also distributing them to their school districts based on the state Title I 2019 funding formula. These funds can be used for tools and resources for distance education, and they can also be used for professional development. There are definitely other uses here, as you can see on the slide, and once again, to refresh your memory, it can be used for any purpose related to any of the challenges that states and schools and school divisions are facing as a result of the COVID-19. But the important thing here is that they can be used very broadly for tools and resources for distance education. So if you're asking, can they be used for software? The answer is yes. Can they be used for hardware? The answer is yes. Can they be used for professional development to support teachers' ability to be able to deliver distance education? Yes. Can they be used for the social and emotional learning needs of teachers, of students, of parents? Yes. So again, as long as states and school districts are able to connect the use of the funds back to any of the challenges related to the um, the COVID-19 challenge, they, are, they have wide flexibility with using these funds. Additionally, um, the United States Department of Education Office of Civil Rights also recently, very just a couple of weeks ago, came out with a fact sheet very clearly specifying that yes, these funds can, or the IDEA funds can be used for distance instruction for students with disabilities. There was some concern in the field that perhaps uh, working with students with disabilities through a distance learning environment and platform would not be in compliance with the law. And so the United States Department of Education acted very quickly and came out with a supplemental fact sheet that specifies that yes, this provision does include the use of IDEA funds for students with disabilities. So let's pause here for a minute. Um, I've given you some very high level um, information about the flexible use of funds. And I'd, I'd love for you to take the opportunity to just think briefly, what does this flexibility mean for you? What are the most pressing needs in your state, in your school district, and your school. Mm, Roberta, we have a really great answer. Um, access to internet and devices. We've definitely been hearing that regularly here at Cal um, and absolutely for sure. Any other ideas, other, other pressing needs that you all are foreseeing? Mm, Margaret um, is reporting that she'd really love to receive some additional professional development. Um, just to do a plug for Cal at this time, we do have a robust professional development team called Cal Solutions. Um, check out our website. I will send it to you now. Mm, communicating, um, this one's really um, insightful, Roberta, um, communicating with households that are Spanish speaking only, especially as a teacher who is um, English speaking only. 
that one's be that one's very difficult. I definitely under, I understand that. Caroline is saying developing rigorous lessons that require um, expressive participation. Um, some of the questions that I'm receiving will hold on to the end um, and ask Roberta at that time. Okay. Well, thank you so much to all of you um, that shared your most pressing needs in your state, in your school, um, in your school district. As we talked about, um, your state and your school district have the flexibility to use those funds to meet all of those needs. They can meet your professional development needs. They can meet your hardware needs. They can meet your software needs. And they can also help provide support for outreach to parents. Um, the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna zoom out for a minute, um, just to refresh your memory that this, the purpose of this webinar is to provide you updates related to policy with regard to distance learning. And so the, the, next, the next slide comes from a 2019 snapshot report uh, from Keeping Pace with K-12 Learning that is looking at what, what does the landscape look like out there with regard to virtual learning? And so the big question here from a policy perspective is were states ready for this pandemic? And you can see here from this slide that um, the states that are highlighted in green are the states that do actually have the ability, or um, not the ability, excuse me, <clears throat> do have virtual schools but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone in the state is taking advantage of them. And as you can see, not every state prior to this pandemic had the ability to have a virtual school. So it made it even more difficult to be nimble and be able to adjust to a distance learning platform. Again, zooming out to the whole United States, um, this slide, shows you the states, and these are the states that are in the red color. These are the states as of 2019 that have, have the ability to have fully on, online schools. And so you can see by this slide, the states are in a little bit better shape in terms of having that ability. But prior to the pandemic, we had very few students taking advantage of the online schools. Um, it ranges from just about 2% in Pennsylvania all the way down to 0.2% in DC. Now, of course, this survey was done before the pandemic. If we were to do the survey now, I think those numbers would look quite different. But I think it's important from a policy perspective to understand what the capacity looked like in the United States before the pandemic hit. The next piece I want to share with you are the top policy concerns. Um, I've been spending a lot of time participating in a lot of different webinars. There was an excellent webinar yesterday um, that I, and I have it included as, as a resource at the end of my presentation from the Center for Educational Progress. And th they are doing a series of webinars um, looking at how states and schools and school districts are having to change as a result of the pandemic and what that means for the future. Um, and another series of webinars has been given by the EWEA Nonprofit Association. And again, they're looking at trying to look at the pandemic for schools from the glass half full perspective. They're trying to, to look at it and see what opportunities do we have? What are the things that um, schools have known that they needed to be doing for a long time, but for whatever reason, just weren't able to get, the, get off the ground? Are we able to use that pan, this pandemic as the impetus for making some of those changes? So yesterday on the webinar that I participated in, there were teachers from New York, teachers from Hawaii, teachers from Austin, Texas, um, as well as educational researchers and policy experts. And they said, their presentation said, and, and I agree with, that the top policy concerns are equity, broadband access, 
and emotional support. And certainly in the earlier questions, we heard that whole challenge with the broadband ac access um, already raised on this webinar. The teachers were very clear um, about equity uh, and the, the fact that prior to this pandemic, we had uneven resources outside of school, but now as a result of the pandemic, the uneven resources have been highlighted and bolded. And additionally, the other thing that has, has become crystal clear through this pandemic is also the uneven funding distribution throughout states um, throughout and throughout school and also throughout school divisions within a state. Um, this is not news probably to anyone who is participating in this webinar. Sadly, it is typically the rural school districts as well as the schools and school districts with the larger percentages of economically disadvantaged students, English learners and students with disabilities that tend to have fewer resources. So when the pandemic hit, and everything had to go convert to an online learning platform, there is very uneven distribution throughout states, throughout school districts, in terms of making sure that every student has access to a learning environment. And um, coupled with that is very obviously the whole issue of broadband access not everyone has the ability to access the internet. It's that simple, but it's also that complicated. The, the researchers and the policy experts yesterday were very clear that they believe that broadband access needs to become a public utility. They believe very strongly that we are no longer in a situation where it is fair and equitable to have people that cannot access the internet. And again, the, um, the, the speed with which everyone in schools and school divisions had to convert to the online learning platform just underlined and scored the challenges with the access. Are there some bright shining lights? Yes, there absolutely are. There are school divisions that are being very creative in partnering with people. There, um, there are school divisions that have done a phenomenal job of gathering together all the resources that they have and distributing, trying to distribute them fairly. But the point that the researchers and the policy experts were making is that school divisions should not have to be scrambling around to do this. They're saying that the future, we don't know what the future is going to look like in terms of the schoolhouse, but one thing we do know is that we have to have better systems for being able to access distance learning. And then last but not least is the whole idea of emotional support. Um, as many of you on this webinar are probably very well aware, school is a safe haven for many, many, many of our students. And the fact that very quickly, almost overnight in some places, students had to shelter at home and or where, wherever they were currently living and receive instruction in whatever environment that was, what has been a challenge for many students. They've lost their safety net of the security of coming to school every day. They've lost their safety net of the um, responsible adults that they can count on at the schoolhouse. And also they've lost the ability to have consistency in their life. And this is, is a very real issue for many, many of our students. Um, and it cuts across all different economic levels. And last but not least under emotional support is the very real situation of trauma. Um, we are all, every one of us is experiencing some type of trauma as a result of this pandemic. And we don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but the teachers were very clear that we have to acknowledge it, we have to name it, and we have to recognize that not only are the students suffering from trauma, but the adults, the teachers, the administrators, the parents are also suffering from trauma. 
and we need to make sure that we are recognizing that and that we are providing support and resources to help people cope with uh, a situation that they have never had to cope with before. In particular, the teacher from New York was participating from his apartment in Harlem and he said all day, every day, he hears sirens going by in New York. And he said that um, many of his students have also faced uh, family members who have died as a result of the COVID-19 virus. And not only have the family members died, but the families haven't been able to mourn in the typical way that they would normally mourn. So it's a double, uh, two strikes against these students because they're in tough situations, they're facing trauma, and they don't have the typical support situations that they previously have had. So these right now are what are bubbling up as the, as the top policy concerns out there with relation to distance learning. So let's pause for a minute and hear what's happening in your state. What are your key policy concerns out there? So what are some of your key policy concerns? Um, any, any takers, any, any thoughts that you'd like to share with the rest of the group from our, our, our participants today? So Chelsea, I'm getting one coming in here on my end and that is people are seconding, thirding, fourthing, fifthing, sixthing, the whole um, concern about the broadband access. They are saying that um, many of the students that they're working with have, um, they just haven't been able to get in contact with them. And, and they're not sure if they're still in their school district or if, um, if, they're, if they just simply um, don't have broadband access. Um, and, and another uh, point that's coming in here is that the whole idea of the emotional support. And they're, they're saying that, you know, teachers really need not only professional learning to help them know how to deliver instruction in a distance learning environment, but they also need support for dealing with their own um, challenges and stresses that they've had with uh, converting to this type of uh, platform as well as knowing how to best support their students. So those are the two that are coming in here from my end. Let me pause and, and see if while I was talking, you had any more come in on your end. Yes, um, a really great one. Um, someone was sharing that they have um, done restorative justice training, um, that they've also um, been doing um, it looks like funding for schools that serve ELs, but apparently our school does not qualify, which is a really, really difficult and a concern for them. Um, there are some teachers are having to do, you know, drive by home visits and um, there's also the concern of documentation. Um, whether some of their students qualify for government economic assistance and um, job assistance and so much insecurity with um, the, the economy right now and how that's really affecting, affecting home, home lives. Um, our, our district has decided not to have summer classes. Um, and that's a real concern, especially for some of my language learners who in, English is not their native language and their their um, and English isn't really often spoken in the home. For sure, that's a really difficult one. How how will schools and summer camps reopen safely? Do all students have access to online um, due to broadband or device issues? 
How can we support social emotional wellness in the homes um, for students and for teachers in a virtual format? And one teacher is sharing that they do many Zoom trainings to help them um, keep in tune to what is out and available. Families being displaced because of, of the current economic situation. So some really, really great, um, really great insightful answers about policy concerns for sure. Thank you everyone for sharing. Yes, th and th thank you so much to everyone. Um, these are very similar to the um, the issues that that have been being shared on a on a nationwide basis. And the only other point that I'd like to bring up is people are yes still coping with our new normal, but people are also starting to feel very anxious, not only about the status of summer programs, but what's going to happen in the fall. Um, and so way flipping all the way back to the beginning of my presentation, those ESSER funds can also be used for planning for, um, for the future, recognizing that e if, if we are fortunate enough to be able to be on site in schoolhouses in the fall, that there is going to be a lot of planning that has to be done that has never been done before. So next, I'm going to move to resources. Um, I, I know that th this is a this is a policy webinar, but I do want to let you know that I I have uh, I'm going to share both some policy resources as well as some instructional resources because while I was doing my research related to the policy, I just came across what I thought might be helpful for instructional resources and. If you're anything like me as a policy person, I can easily take off my policy hat and put my instructional hat on at any moment. So first of all, just big picture, um, the United States Department of Education is one of your top policy resources. They have information related to the COVID-19 resources. And this is where they are keeping all of their information and provide you with regular policy updates. The next um, policy brief under the, from the Digital Learning Collaborative is where I took the, the slides where I was sharing the data. Um, they have a 2019 report that I think is really going to be useful as a baseline for how we're going to develop policy to, um, to react to the COVID pandemic. And then finally, the Center for Ed, um, American Progress has this series of managing transition to virtual schooling webinars that are quite excellent. And one of the things that I think is so excellent about them is that they, they have teachers, they have practitioners, as well as policy experts and researchers all talking on various topics. So you really get the breadth and the depth of the different topics. Um, resources for instruction, of course, as Chelsea mentioned, um, come to our website at, at Cal. We have free instructional resources for English learners and multilingual learners. And we also have um, uh, professional development courses for teachers and resources for parents. Color in Colorado is one I mentioned um, last week, if you were with us. And then the NWEA also has a wealth of free digital resources. And from their webinars is where I got the information for the next three slides. Um, full disclosure, I have not checked out every single one of these links, um, but I have done a random sample. And these, uh, these are reading resources that are very, very, very high quality and all available free. These are math resources, again, that are extremely high quality and available for, to you um, at no charge. And then finally, these are multiple subject resources. Um, and there are here some resources available in Spanish as well as some resources available with the social emotional learning piece. 
um, on the webinar that I participated in yesterday, many of the teachers recognized the need for social emotional learning, but they were really struggling to, to find resources. Um, so let me uh, close it out here with the, with the final slide. Um, I think we have a few minutes to take questions, um, if we have any, Chelsea. Yes, Roberta, we've had a few questions, particularly um, towards the beginning. We had a question about um, could ESSER funds uh, be used to set up summer schools? Do you know, um, Roberta? Um, yeah, I would say yes, that, you know, the, under the broad per use of the funds, they absolutely can be used to set up summer school because you can tie that need to the challenges that your school district or your state is facing on, from the COVID-19. Now, you need to check with your school district to see if that's how they're choosing to use their funds, but can they be used for that? The answer is yes. All right. We've had some really great engagement in the question box, so I, I appreciate everyone's great engagement. Um, I, so what was, um, what can you mention the webinar again that you were um, participated in yesterday? What um, and what organization yeah. was it, Roberta? Yes, I've just returned. I returned to the policy slide. It is the third bullet here, the Center for American Progress, and it's their quality education series, managing the transition to virtual schooling, and the the um, the link should be live. And if, if it's not, I'll put my um, contact, my, I'll show my contact information here in a minute. Um, and I'm happy to send you the link uh, directly. Um, and I just sent, I sent out the those links that we just saw on, on the oh, uh, screen um, to all the perfect. chat box. Um, we had a question in regards to Roberta. Do you think um, there's possibilities that in the fall classroom sizes will be reduced? I, that is definitely being discussed. Um, the policy experts yesterday were saying that, um, yes, it's very possible that class, si you know, class size will be reduced. And meant there are um, some states that are talking about also doing um, a type of alternate scheduling uh, where, you know, students in group A come on Mondays, students in group B come on Tuesdays. Um, they're also talking about having hybrid approaches whereby they have some on-site classes and others in a distance learning format. So I don't believe any state has finally decided exactly what they're going to do, but there are a lot of options on the table. Um, and if you have strong feelings, I would encourage you to reach out to your school district, reach out to your state, make sure your voice is being heard. Um, part of a requirement of a state when they re it, for receipt of the ESSERS funds is they have to seek comment from the public and they have to either take the public comment into consideration or they have to explain how they addressed whatever public comment they received. And um, on that note, oh, I'm sorry, Chelsea, go ahead, one more. Well, we had a few questions about um, the resources, the math and the reading resources. Um, I'll make sure to include the PDF of these slides in the follow-up email so everyone will receive those um, those resources Great. as well. So. Okay, super. Well, with that, I think that we are at time. So once again, I wanna thank you uh, for joining us today at the Center for Applied Linguistics for the fourth in our series of Cal Policy One Takes. And thank you, Chelsea, for all your support. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We have we always have such a great, wonderful discussion on our um, Policy One Takes. Um, so thank you so much for all of, the, all of you who have been so engaged. Um, again, thank you to our teachers, to our um, 
first responders, to our medical professionals, to our parents, to our teachers, um, and to all of you out there who are doing your part. We really appreciate you, um, and we hope you all have a great rest of your day, and I will follow up with an email with those slides. So thank you, Roberta, for the wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Have a good one, y'all.